Good morning and welcome to Heritage Baptist Church. We're glad you're here today. I am the B team. Brother Bill is not here today due to illness, so pray for him to get real well real soon. So if you would, stand with me and sing number 230. Number 230, please. Do you know that you've been born again? Dear Lord and love, Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for your blessings. Thank you that we can be here today to hear your word. I pray that you would open our hearts to the message you have for us. Give the preacher the words to speak. Let us glorify you in everything we do. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. We'll sing the next one, which is number uh, 283, Joy Unspeakable. I have found his grace is all complete. Day is higher than we need. While I sit and learn at Jesus' feet, I am free, yes, free indeed. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. It is joy unspeakable. Thank you, Brother Richard. I appreciate that. Is that a good song? Do you like, I like singing. You know, do you guys like the singing part? Good to have you here with us this morning. Next Sunday is Mother's Day. Do you know that? Next Sunday is Mother's Day. Part of you have already got your big treasure box out for your kids to bring everything they're bringing in the 
hundreds of cards you're going to be getting and all that stuff. And I know you are. Amen. Uh, I won't know about that, but I know if you come here next week, I'll talk to you about what God thinks a little bit about mothers. There, there is a lot written in the scripture about mothers and fathers, but there's a lot written about that. And if you think how important mothers are, you, you think about this. One of the last things, Jesus said seven things from the cross, almost all have to do with eternity, the payment being paid, the value of what he did, except for one. When he looked down at this disciple John and told her to take care of his mother for the rest of his life. Think how important moms must be for Jesus to say that from the cross. So we, we're going to try to honor that too. We're glad to have you with us. Got a small gift for you if you'll show up and we're looking forward to having you here with us. And then, of course, we got a couple of things coming up. In the, we have Bible school coming up in June. You can look up the dates on the website. And we have... Camp coming up in July. That'll be an exciting time for us. We get to go to camp this year. We like it. And in the meantime, we're, if you're going to go with us, we have a, a, a special time. We're going to go out with the youth group and with the Bible club people. We're going to go to, uh, part of your older folks may want to come with us. We're going to go to o Urban Air. It's nothing but a whole bunch of trampolines. Can you see yourself on a trampoline out there? You know what I mean? Is that... Yeah, I, one of my ladies said, I could see myself face down on one of them right now. But uh, that's going to be fun. We'll get together and go, and we'll, it'll be a good time just jumping around, burning up some energy, right? But, you know, the, the Lord always has an opportunity, not just at church, but for you everywhere, to serve. You can be faithful in your tithes and offerings. You can be faithful with giving. And I, and I tell people this, say, well, preacher, you know, I don't want to send my money to your church. Well, don't send it here then. But you still owe a tithe. I don't care where you send it, so send it wherever you think God would have you put it, okay? Any, and you owe him an offering, you know. A tithe is a debt you owe. An offering is a seed that you sow. I promise you, God loves cheerful givers. And you can, everybody in the whole world don't send the money here, which is, I'm grateful, we'd have to hire somebody to count it, right? And you have trouble staff is. <laughs> but anyhow, but we would, uh, we're, we're, we encourage you to just serve the Lord everywhere you go, all the time. Look for an opportunity to talk to somebody about Jesus. Pass out a track or two, you know, put it in a, uh, I found out something, you know, doing all these things. People want to take things from you. Uh, I don't know if you know this or not. When you go like to a fast food place and they bring it out in a little box, somebody touched it before they put it in a box. But don't think about that. that that'll bring your whole day down, okay? Put it down and go get you one of those little baggies that you can stick your track into and then offer it to them. And they might be a little bit more receptive. You say, well, <clears throat> what do they need? I want them to read it. But they mostly just to be able to invite them to come to church and ask them if they're about an opportunity to know the Lord. And so you do that. Think about some time that you can do that for somebody this week and see if God didn't open up a door for you. We got a special treat coming up here. We have a young lady that's going to come up and she's going to read one of our missions letters. And we're excited for her to come up here right now. Come on, sweet John. Our missionaries of the month are the Browns in Croatia. We appreciate all your prayers and support during this time of recovery from the earthquakes. It took some time for our family to find peace during the tremors. Our son once said after experiencing an aftershock that they do not bother him anymore. Yes, when we feel them, we pause and prepare to take cover. But once the troubling stops, we are able to return quickly. This evidence that we are where God wants us to be. Kevin met a man who lived alone in the vill in a village. While eating lunch, everything began to shake. He was able to run out in time to watch his home collapse. We explained how God spared his life so that we could Tell them about the gospel of Christ. 
It was humbling to see the Spirit of God move his heart. Since the earthquake, Christine and the girls have been assisting in a children's club in one of the temporary village display residents. So children has beginning to to show more interest in the program. We are ex- we are a pre- expecting a blessed year in spite of the challenges we have been facing recently. Thank you for your donations. Work has already begun cleaning up from the damage damage. The old stone house has been demolished and moved removed. So soon we will work on the interior of the main house. Thank you. Hey, you are. We were uh, we're fortunate to have great people to play. And if you play or have an instrument or do something, we'd like for you to include it in our services. Okay, try to try to get a gospel song together of some kind and bring it in. And let's let's listen to your talent for the Lord. We'll find a place for you. So, preacher, I want to do that right now. Now, we love singing together as quartet. Don't sit down, Richard. (laughs) And this is one of the songs we're going to sing. Here we go. There is not another sister, friend, or brother loves the way that Jesus can. He proved his love for me when he died on Calvary. He gave his life for fallen man. His love, his love is a boundless love, and it reaches down and touches me. His love is an endless love that will last through all eternity. Jesus wants to love you. There is none above you. You are precious in his sight. He will never fail you when the doubts assail you. He'll be with you day and night. His love love is a boundless love, and it reaches down and touches me. His love love is an endless love that will last you all eternity. His love love is a boundless love, and it reaches down and touches me. His love love is an endless love that will last throughout eternity. His love love is love. Let's turn with me to the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk, according to what part of the country you're from, okay? And we're going to get my sermon up here, and I want to preach to you this morning about the difference between saying, I never heard, and I never believed what I heard. There's a difference. I never heard that. Now, if you've ever raised a teenager, Them hearing it has not much effect on the response. Okay. Did you hear me? Yes. All right. And and somewhere in there, those of you who have raised one, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? You said, my kid was perfect. Yeah. We knew you thought that. But anyhow, if you got your Bibles, I want you to look there with me. How many of you found Habakkuk already? 
Okay. Now, now, if they pronounce, if you were Jewish and you're out there right now saying, boy, he talks like a Texan. Thank God. Amen. Amen. But uh, and they don't say that word that way. And they would pronounce it a little bit different. And we'll get into that sometime when we're teaching Hebrew in your, our church. The burden, which Habakkuk, eh, that, we're going to see. There you go. The Jewish prophet did see. O Lord, how long shall I cry and thou will not hear? Even crowd unto thee of violence and thou will not save. Now I want you to think with me what he's saying. This prophet, see, he's in Israel when Israel is in its declining days. They're turning away from God. They're doing the things you read about in the book of Ezekiel that God shows Ezekiel. They're worshiping the sun. They're worshiping the moon. They're worshiping idols. They're they're offering their children, their live children, to Baal the sacrifices in the beginning of this. And he sees that coming. He sees that coming. And he's asking God, <clears throat> why don't you do something? Why don't you do something about it? Aren't you the God that takes care of it? Why don't you stop this? Can I, can I just throw this out here for you guys? You say, preacher, why doesn't God stop evil in the world? What would he do with you and me? I had a man one time said, you know what? God should just kill everybody that starts to do some ungodly thing. I said, well, you want me to pray about that next time you get a beer? You, how about it just breaks your arm? You know, when you try to open it, but go, as soon as he hears the part that your arm just goes like rubber. Okay. No, not me. Isn't that funny? See, we're always asking for mercy. God's got some plenty coming for him. And he asked the question. I'm going to tell you how this story is going to go. God's going to tell him what he's going to do. When you look at the last part of the chapter, he goes, are you sure, Lord? That's a lot. <clears throat> because he doesn't like what the Lord's going to do. See, but the trouble of this is, I'll give you a heads up on this, is that this God's told them this same thing of what he's going to do now way before now. At least 15 times he's told them what he's going to do if they don't straighten up. We quote a verse all the time. You know, and I, and I think what you do, you, get, you take what the Apostle Paul said. All these things happen to them as examples for us. Did you get that? All right. Now, you can condemn anybody you want out there, but what are you doing? You, you, you understand where America's going? Do you see what's happening around us, guys? We're, we're trying, we, we don't even know what truth is anymore. The prophet would say truth is falling in the streets and we don't know anything about it. It's, it's trying to figure it out. We're like Pilate going, what is truth? We're trying to see all that. I said something the other day to a to a lady and I said, you know, we're all required to see the king's clothes. How many of you know what that means? We're all required. Y'all don't. Did y'all not read anything when you're in early school stuff? The, the guy without clothes? Okay. We're all required to see the king's clothes. Well, I want you to understand that the Bible says, look at verse 4. Here's what he's saying. Therefore, the law is slack. He said, he's making an accusation against God. God, you made the rule, he made the law, and you said this is going to happen, and it hadn't happened yet. Okay. Do you hear what I just said? He just made, did you see what he just said? Therefore, the law is slack. And judge of the, the never go forth. See that word never? Never say never. Never say never. I'm going to tell you something. If you want to get along in your family, you can do a little family counseling here. When you're talking to each other in that really excited tone, you know you do, don't say always. You always do that. First of all, it's not true. You should say 80% of the time you do that. See, that would be more truthful, right? But I still wouldn't recommend that, right? Right down to it. He said, judgment doth never go forth, for the wicked doth compass about the righteous, therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. Now watch verse 5. Here's the Lord's answer. Behold ye among the heathen and regard. 
Listen to me, I'm going to tell you something. And wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days, which you will not believe, though it be told you. See the difference between what I never heard and I never believed what I heard. You will not believe, though it be told you. Now watch what he said. For I will raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity proceed of themselves. The horses also are swifter than the leopards and are more fierce than the evening wolves and their horsemen have spread themselves and the horsemen shall come from far and they shall fly as eagles that hasteth to eat. They shall come all for violence. Their faces shall sup up as the east wind. They shall gather the captivity as the sand. That's how many captives they're going to take. And they shall scoff at the kings and the princes shall be a scorn unto them they shall deride every stronghold, for they shall heap dust and take it. Then shall his mind change, and he shall pass over, offend, imputing his power unto his God. Now, if you look to the next verse, which I'm not going to deal with in this sermon, he says, <clears throat> Lord, aren't you from everlasting to everlasting? Uh, aren't your pure eyes to let the evil people win? Didn't he just tell him to do something about his people, how wicked they were? And when he does, he goes, that's a little drastic, Lord. You know, you've been praying for it, right? You ever prayed for the Lord just to get rid of all the wicked people in the land? Not me. You, you understand that? You say, well, would I like to see him be a little bit more Christian? Yeah, I would. I'd like to see him believe the Bible a little bit more. But if God get rid of all the wicked, we'd all be gone. For there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that doeth good. There's none. You say, well, but I'm the exception to that. No, you're not. So what we want to look at today is, is simply a, a great thing. Look at this. What is it you never heard, but if you did hear it, you wouldn't believe it? What is it you, you never said, well, I've heard that, but if I did believe it, I don't believe it. You ever been told something? I don't believe that. That's not what I believe. Do you know how many people I've told about the Lord Jesus Christ in my lifetime? Do you know how many people that I've told them the promises of God that they can confess the Lord Jesus when they believe on Him with their heart and they've walked away just like they came in because they heard it but they didn't believe it? Do you know how many Christian people hear the preacher preaching about the judgment that God does? We're waiting for the Lord to judge the world. But if you read your Bible first, guys, you know who the first group that gets judged? It's us. We're the first group to get judged. Way before he judges the world, he judges us. We purposely disbelieve things that do not fit our point of view, my personal point of view. Well, I don't believe that, so that's that, that's I'm sure you join with all the atheists and everybody else that's out there. They don't, you know, they can say what they want. They can decry there's no God, there's no eternity, there's nothing there. Doesn't change God. Doesn't change my life. Because I can tell you there is a God out there because he saved me. And if any, everybody in the whole world might not understand it, but I understand it because I know what he did in my life. We pass off things that are promised but are not carried through immediately. That's the, that's the problem. And you say, Preacher, where are you going with this? Well, the first time God told him what you just read in Habakkuk, God told it to him from the book of Deuteronomy. And he called out the ones who were going to do it before they were a nation. That he was going to use the Babylonians to do it. The Chaldeans. They would be the ones to do it. In the book of Deuteronomy. They've been hearing it ever since then. Don't know that it made a whole lot of difference by the time we got there. But can I ask you a question? Did it happen? The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish. Was everybody in Israel a wicked, sorry, worthless sinner? 
No, they weren't. Because you got people like Daniel and all those other friends of his and Ezekiel. And there are lots of good people there that were carried away. But as a whole, most didn't. Solomon said this is the reason. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. One of the things that you can notice, we're, we're living in a time when every logical person knows we cannot continue to exist as a free nation if we keep increasing the burden of financial debt that we're putting on our grandchildren and great-grandchildren if they make it that far. Now, I read the other day, I did not go back and check it out with everybody that I know of, but I read the other day that if every man, woman, boy, and girl, a citizen of the United States would come up with about $8 million, we could pay a good portion of our national debt so we could afford to pay the interest on it. We, you say, well, preacher, you know, there's so many wonderful things that, that we need to do. Isn't that the way you felt about Christmas? You know, when you, had, you just had to have all them presents until the credit card bill came in on January. And you're thinking, stupid toys, you know. Can I tell you guys, I understand. God is a great God. And he will tell, and, and, and he's, he's real lenient as far as judgment. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's been extremely merciful. He's been extremely good to us as Christians. And I, I, has anybody here ever said, you know what I wish? I wish I'd have been born in Bangladesh. Or maybe one of those impoverished South American countries. Or maybe one of those Caribbean island countries where they, like the Dominican. Boy, I, I wanted to be born there. When I was a kid, and I was over there as a young man, in one of those countries, I noticed that all the kids had on shirts, but none of them had on pants or skirts or anything. Just, just the shirt, sort of like Donald Duck, you know what I mean? Just the shirt. And I asked somebody, I said, How, why do they all have shirts, but they don't have on any pants or shirts? We bought them, people. he goes, shirts don't wear out as fast. You only got one church. That's, see, that was the thing. They just had one church. I, I'm, I don't know about you guys, but I grew up pretty poor in the United States of America, but I think I always had more than one church. And I had two, three pairs of pants, thank the Lord, amen. But if we creep in doing that, see, we know that, but we just don't want to believe it. Can I tell you, the same thing applies to spiritual things. The nations that forget God shall be turned into, what's the word? Hell. Didn't say we was all going there, but what we, what we live here is going to be kind of that same torment in it. Jeremiah said this in, uh, in to a, a man when he's telling in Jeremiah, he's preaching what God's going to have him come. And this guy named Pashur, which means prosperity everywhere. Pasture, prosperity everywhere. Jeremiah told him that what was going to happen was that Tophet, which was the dump, would be the next thing needed to take all the bodies into because it would be filled up with graves when the enemy got through with them. And Pasture, of course, he stopped him from saying it. And Jeremiah turned around and he said, Thy name will no longer be called Pasture, not prosperity everywhere. It shall be called Megor Misabob. You say, well, what's that mean? It means terror all around. Terror all around. See, just because people hear it don't mean they believe it. The judgment to come is just part of the things that are hard to believe. I hear the word of the Lord, King of Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I'll bring evil upon this place, which whosoever heareth, his ears will tingle. Because they have forsaken me, have estranged this place, burned incense in it unto other gods whom neither they nor their fathers have known. And they did what to Jeremiah? They arrested him and threw him into the dungeon. It wasn't a popular preaching article at the time. The judgment promised was going to be 
swift and terrible when it came. You know, the Bible says a lot of things like this. That when the Lord comes, it'll be quick. And, that, and somehow in America, we thought that it meant, it meant soon. Quick don't mean soon. Quick means fast. Quick means move or moving. Once it starts, we're alive. It's another word for living. It's going to be just like, it's going to spread like a bad disease when it comes. When he, and the judgment will, and the coming of the Lord will be quick. Nobody else, Jesus said it'll be like lightning coming out of the east. We'll, it'll, you won't have to doubt when it happens. He said, I've set before you this day. Look at this. Here's the verse out of Deuteronomy. Life and death, good and evil. That I can command you this day to love the Lord with God, walk in His ways, keep His commandments, and His statutes and His judgments. Thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God will bless thee in the land where thou goest possess it. But if thine heart turn away, so they will not hear, but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce upon you this day that you shall surely perish, and that you shall not prolong your days in the, in the, upon the land, whither thou passest over in Jordan to go possess it. And I call heaven and earth to record against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing, cursing. Therefore, choose life, that both thy and thy seed may live. See, we have those verses all over the Scripture. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. and turn. See, we got those things. You say, well, you know, I, Lord, when it, when it gets really bad, I'm getting to it. That when that judgment comes, there won't be any exclusions. This is out of Ezekiel. He said, Son of man, when the land sinneth against me by trespassing grievously, thou stretch out my hand upon it, and break off the staff of bread, will send famine upon it, will cut off man and beast from it. Now watch what he says three times in this portion of Scripture. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job. Now those guys seem pretty close to God, don't you think? Noah, Daniel, and Job. They should be delivered but their own souls by their righteousness. The next thing he said, he said, if it, and if I make a northern beast to pass, they pull it and be desolate. If these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job pray, they shall deliver only themselves. Then he said, the last time, if a sword go through it, when it does, these three guys will deliver themselves but nobody else. And it's a strange thing about lost people. It's a strange thing about wicked people. It's a strange thing about backslidden Christians. Do you know where they, who ex they expect to make up the difference in their life when they do the wrong thing? When's the last time you've seen a guy that spent all of his rent money on booze and alcohol and stuff go down to the local bar and see if they can pay his rent? Where do they go to, guys? They come straight to the people who don't do that and they remind us that we're obligated of God to care about them. Isn't that true? Come on. I don't care what kind of vice you're into. I don't care what kind of foolishness you're in. I don't care what it is. You watch and see how many people believe in the forgiveness principle between God and us and us and other people when they do wrong. They're the first one, hey, you're supposed to forgive people, you know. Where do they go to? They come to us. You know when their houses fall apart and their homes fall apart and their families go apart? Where do they go to? Who's supposed to fix it? They come to the people they know have an answer and believe what they don't believe and expect us to take. And he, God said, let me tell you something, guys. Here's the principle. These are the guys here preaching. And they'd get to take care of themselves but it won't cover everybody else. You say, well, as long as there are a lot of good people left in America, as long as there are a lot of good Christians, and still, as long as there's few out there, God will, He won't do anything with our country. Come on, guys, get over there. That's not what He said. Do I believe God's going to be with me? Absolutely. Through anything that happens, everything that happens, will I like it? No. Uh -uh. Didn't say I'd like it. I just know that no matter what I know, He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. When you pass through the fires, I'll be with you. I'm not crazy about passing through fires. How about you guys? The judgment's going to remove Israel, the ten tribes, when I say Israel, and keep them from regathering ever since. They never came back. The ten tribes got carried away. 
and they've never been back. The same mighty ten tribes, they were way outnumbering over Judah. But the same God that watched over Judah while they were doing what they were supposed to is the same one that allowed the Assyrians to come and take them away. The judgment will remove Judah from the eye of human eye when they took were carried out by Babylon for almost 2,000 years. I've got like 25 quotes from famous people who, who swore, people like Mark Twain, that Israel was just a ghost and it would never be real again. He just didn't live long enough to see it happen, did he? Okay, can I tell you, that he hadn't seen anything yet because I don't believe what's in Israel right now is the promise fulfilled of everything God's promised that will come to Israel. That's just a shadow of things, of what he can do. And boy, he's doing great things. I wish you could get a report of everything that Israel's doing. Um, you know where we get most of our technology from when it comes to taking care of terroristic problems? Israel. Yeah. They're pretty good at that stuff. They're saying they think they've developed a vaccine for Alzheimer's. Woohoo! Amen. You know how close I am to that? You know? I'm glad. I hope it works. They're working on that right now. They got all kinds of things going on that they're working on. But Judah would be gone for 2,000 years. Their language would be a dead language. That's a dead language. Nobody speaks it anymore. That's, you know, Latin is a dead language. You know that, right? Do people use it? Yeah. That, you know why they use it? Because it doesn't change. It stays the same. makes great stuff for medicine. Science and all that, because it stays exactly the same. Unlike English, which changes daily. Then one of the priests whom they had carried away from Samaria came and dwelt in Bethel and taught them how they should fear the Lord. That's what happened in the north. And he, he did the strangest things. And I, I want you to see. So Assyria carried the northern ten tribes off. It was another... A mm, couple hundred years before they carried off the last, the Babylonians came in and took off the last part of Judea. But in the meantime, the Assyrians brought in people from all over the world and put them in the land. See, God had this thing about that land. It was a holy land. And it belonged, to, we should call it the holy land. That's right. It was a holy land. It was set apart for God. It was special. And God gave it to his people. And he said, you get to live there as long as you do what I tell you. And then when you don't, you do, he removed them out. I'm going somewhere, folks. Don't go to sleep yet. I know it's past the second verse of the third song, but we're okay. All right? But you know what? When they came into the land, everything went wrong. Even the animals turned against them. The lions were killing them and all kinds of weird stuff. And so the Bible says that the king of Assyria said, get one of those priests that belong to the Lord and send him over there and have him teach everybody how not to do things to offend the God of Israel. Isn't that weird? And he did. And one of the priests whom they carried away from Samaria came to at Bethel and taught them how they should fear the Lord. You'll find a little bit later on somebody says of that, come to Bethel and sin. Kind of neat thing. Look at verses though. So they feared the Lord and made unto themselves the lowest of them priests of the high places and sanctified for them in the houses of the places. They feared the Lord and served their own gods after the manner of the nations that were carried away from them. Unto this day they do so. The ten tribes never came back. The judgment of God wasn't all bad, guys, by carrying Israel out of the land. It did something that nobody could imagine, but had been promised even before the judgment was promised. Back in the book of Genesis, in chapter 12, the scripture says that God promised Abraham through thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. 
Now, I'm, I think it's a wonderful thing that Israel's in the world. They're not that blessing. What blessed the whole earth was that through that remnant of the Jewish people that God carried away came the Savior. He kept them. Now think about this. They had a covenant with God. In the land, you either do what I tell you or you're going to suffer all these things. You know what he did? When they would not listen to the chastisement that he gave, they wouldn't heed the things that he had told them. When they wouldn't change their mind, he had an alternative. He could say, okay, I'm just going to kill them all. But he didn't. He said, I got a better idea. I'll just take them out of the land. And he did. Ezekiel chapter 11 said, Therefore say, Thus saith the Lord God, although I have cast them off among the heathen, and although I have scattered them among the countries, yet will I be unto them a little sanctuary in the countries where they shall come to. Therefore say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, I will gather you even from those people and assemble you out of the countries you have been scattered. And I will again give you the land of Israel. And he brought them back in time for the Lord Jesus Christ to be born when he wanted him, where he wanted him, and fulfill all the prophecies. If you'd have been around 500 years before that, when they were scattered all over the face of the earth, 600 years before that, when Nehemiah and Ezra all came back and it was nothing, you think they'd, uh, they grabbed a hold of that real quick? Hey, everybody, guess what? Someday there's going to be a big old temple here. We're going to have this. When Nehemiah and Ezra finished that first temple, the Bible says that the temple was a little box rock house. And compared to what Solomon's temple had been covered with gold and it's so elaborate, that when the old men who were old enough to remember before the 70 years captivity saw it, they cried. This is the best we got. The Lord told him something. He said, this temple that you see today in Ezra is going to have greater glory than any other one that will ever be built. How would that be? Because the remnant of that temple would be the temple that the Lord Jesus walked into. He bought his heritage temple, huge outside covenant. That little piece was still in there. And our Lord was there. The glory of that one was way better than anything anybody could make in the world. And the Bible says God did all that stuff so that in the fullness of time was come, God sent forth a sign made of a woman made under the law. You understand Jesus came exactly where he wanted him to be. He came as he was prophesied when he wanted him to be. He lived the life he told him to live. Just nothing he did. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of scriptures that fulfill and are fulfilled in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, including judgments. I'm not great fond of judgments myself, amen? But I can tell you that I can believe that just like I can believe the promises. You know how come he said Isaiah 7, 14? You ever read the whole portion of scripture? Got a king there that doesn't believe anything God said. And he asked him, Ask me a sign. I'll give it to you. And the king goes, I ain't asking nothing. He did too. In Hebrew, I ain't still in there. He said, I ain't asking nothing. I'm not asking you anything. And he said, I'll give you a sign. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive, bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. How many, how many of you to that? Does that thing make perfect sense? That verse. That there's going to be a virgin conceive and bear a son. And we're going to call his name God with us. When he quoted that, everybody's around going, what does that mean? That a virgin's going to... Do you understand what we know to be fulfilled and we take absolute joy in believing? They had to believe ahead of time. Most of them didn't, even though they heard it. The scripture is pretty good about this. The judgment that happened to them would allow the inclusion of the whole world into God's mercy. Think what I just said. 
In that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles see. Ooh, ooh, that's me. One of those Gentile people. And his rest shall be glorious. It, it won't even be worldly. It'll be transcending the world. It'll be transcending this whole life and everything physical. Because he would do something for us. He remember he said, I'll bless them that bless thee, curse them that curseth thee, and thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Remember the verse of quote, we want to go look at this. And he said, it's a light thing that thou should be servant to raise up the trials of Jacob. This is what he's talking to the Lord before he's born in prophecy. And to restore the preserved of Israel, I will give thee for a light. Also I'll give thee for a light to the Gentile, that thou mayest be my salvation to the end of the earth. What do you think? What do you think? Everybody in heaven and everybody that's around and all of us, aren't you glad that God kept His word and didn't destroy, destroy Israel? But He moved them out of the land so they'd be out from under the judgment. Seemed really drastic at the time, didn't it? But He preserved the good, didn't He? he that's what He does. God's a God of mercy. You say, well, everybody didn't get it. Everybody wasn't good. The plan would open up. The judgment would open up a plan that only God knew. Remember what he told him? He said, I'm going to tell you something. It's going to make your ears tingle. You ever heard news like that? He wasn't going to do this. And watch what he tells him. Because we're thinking about the judgment. We're thinking about the Christ. To Israel, listen to this. You know what he told him, guys? I'm not going to get into it today because of time. But I want you to understand. You know, how many of you ever read the book of Daniel? And you says that Daniel was commanded not to pray, but he went every day and he opened his window toward Jerusalem and he prayed every day. You know what God told them? He said, if you're in the land, you got to do the Passover thing. You got to do this. You got to do that. You got to do this. It has to be this way. Or that. But if you're out of the land, you don't. Just turn your face toward Jerusalem and I'll remember the last one I took and roll your sins away another year. Now who's the merciful one now? But you know what? He didn't say he's going to roll them away in this covenant that he brought through Christ. He's not going to just do a Passover. That means to hide from your side. Not be able to see it. But he's going to take away the sins of the people. And over and over and over, he would say, and the sins and your iniquities, look at the last part of the verse, from the least of them to the greatest, saith the Lord, for I will give their iniquity, back in Jeremiah, and I will remember their sin no more. You know why? Look at the first verse. This shall be the covenant that I make with Israel. Guess what? We get included in that covenant. Because of what he did and the judgment to come, which they said, that'll never happen. The scripture says that they said that Jeremiah, he said, they said, well, we're the flesh and the cities that caught, and what would God do without us? Don't ever ask him that, okay? He can, he can make it. I saw a sign on a Church thing one time it says, Man without God is nothing, and God without man is still God. Remember that song they used to sing, the White Ells used to sing it, you know? It, it's not of what he did, it's who he was. Now I'm grateful for what he does, but it was who he was that made him what he is. For I'll be merciful to their unrighteousness. Paul quotes the verse in Hebrews, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Not just to pass over the sin. To cover it, but to take it away. Whew, that's good stuff, isn't it? That is good stuff. The, the judgment would be this. For by one offering, he hath perfected ever, forever them that are sanctified. For, for the Holy Ghost also witnessed to us, after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make of them those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their hearts and their minds, and I will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. If you read down through verse 18, he said, where remission of these things are, there's no more offering for sin. Don't need one. 
You don't have to offer a goat or a cow or a sheep or anything else. The Bible says those things could never take away sin, but the blood of Jesus Christ could take away sin. But you had to get Him there. And He had to keep the people of Israel <laughs> alive until you could get Him through those generations and come to there. And God's judgment, which seemed almost ridiculously harsh, even when we read it today, was for our mercy. I will work a work in your day that you will not believe. Can I tell you today that it's the same God that said that? There's some people listening. There's somebody out here who would say, well, I know that he saves people, but he won't say it. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. Who in your family is the most hopeless? Who is the most hopeless? Do you not believe what God said? If you call on me, I'll answer you. You quit. You already resigned in your heart. I heard that, but I don't believe it. I'm not doing it. Hey guys, I, I got people on my prayer list. And I say, Lord, I'm bringing them in front of you. I don't even exactly know what to ask for in their life. But I'm not going to quit bringing them in front of you, Lord. And I want you to remember them and work in their life. Don't ever let them go without you working in their life. You say, oh, preacher, you know, I just don't believe God's going to do that and God could never reach them. And God, you know what, guys? Your preacher almost went to hell because I had a whole town full of people that believed I didn't want to hear the gospel. And God had to drag somebody from a foreign place into my hometown to tell me about Jesus. Because they were just sure I never wanted to hear. Is it what you never heard? Or is it what you don't believe that you have heard? Is the problem. The Bible says that that vision for them was for an appointed time. But if you go back to that same book of Habakkuk, chapter 2 says that vision is for an appointed time. I know the time we're living in. And he said the strangest thing in the midst of judgment over law. We say it constantly. For the just shall live by his faith. Who would have believed that? But we do. Who would have believed that? I, how back at chapter 2, 12? The earth shall be filled with the knowledge and the glory of the Lord. Is it not? Is everybody doing right? No way, but I bet you can't go many places on the face of the earth today that somebody there had already heard about Jesus. You say, well, preacher, you know, listen to me like everything's out of hand. Listen to another verse out of Habakkuk. But the Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. I like what the psalmist said. And he doeth as he will. Right? He said, preacher. <clears throat> See, here's the question. Same one he, he asked. God told Habakkuk. He goes, listen. Is it because you haven't heard? Or is it because you haven't believed? What you've heard. Now I'm a funny guy, this preacher up here. I believe real faith motivates to action. When I was a kid, young and my dad believed that kids were cheap labor. Obviously, they were free labor. Until I found out how much it cost to feed me. Because it wasn't free. Cheap labor. And we were working on a, another man's farm. We did that back in those days. We'd go from one place to the other. And my, <clears throat> my dad was a worker. He, he liked to play and he loved to do recreation and carried us everywhere we want. And great guy. But when he worked, he worked. 
and we were working there together and the man's son who owned the farm came around and we were putting things into garbage cans. I'll tell you about that in another story. And that young man thought it would be funny and he set it in the row of garbage cans. He caught a rattlesnake about five foot long and he put it in the garbage can. Now, I didn't know he did it or I'd have told my dad ahead of time. But my dad walked over to get the next can and he grabbed the lid to pull the lid off. And of course, you know what rattlesnakes do when you... He, he came alive. Wouldn't he have problems? Or Daddy put the lid back on it. I remember him turning around like this and he said, he called that young man by name. He said, I'm going to count to five. If that can and that snake aren't gone, I'm going to open the lid one more time and put you in there. He believed him. I wanted to see him do it. Because I believed him too. You say, how do you know he believed him? Because he never spoke a word or took another breath. And he had the can and was gone. Don't tell me you believe. And it doesn't affect your actions. He'll do it every time. James says, you can tell me of your faith, but I will show you of my faith by my works. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, what a privilege to serve you. What a privilege to have the word of God. What a tragedy, Lord, not to believe. Lord, I believe that you have an answer for every one of us. And that no matter how it seems and how far away people get, that somehow, some way, you're dealing with the hearts of every human on the face of the earth. And I'm praying, Lord, that those that are on my prayer list, and Lord, whoever you will, you touch their hearts. Come to that place every one of us came to, I did, that I realized that the whole everything I'd ever had and done didn't mean much unless I could take care of my relationship with God. And Lord, I pray that today, that you would work on hearts, not let one of our kids escape, not let any of them run away, but forever and ever work on their hearts, Lord. Help them to know that they're loved and that they're loved by you. And Lord, the calling they put on their life, that you put on their life, hasn't stopped. And that, Lord, every time we mess up, we have a promise that if we confess our sin, you'll forgive us. And Lord, I pray that we wouldn't just hear it, but that we'd believe it. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me. Number 153. I surrender all. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this time to come to your house, Lord, to worship you, to fellowship with others, Lord, to learn from your word. Lord, we pray that you would help us to always look to you for everything. Lord, we praise you and thank you for this serving. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.